Hey kids, you're listening to the internet's wettest podcast about video games, consoles, and pancakes. The SML Podcast. What's up, everybody? This is the SML Podcast. I am your host, Joe. It is a party cast, and we've got Tim, Purnell, and Chris here. How is everyone doing? I'm all right. Is it? I'm yeah. Fantastic. Chasing, yeah, it's one Chasing garbage pail kids, and I don't like it. Cause I was, was going to say, like, I feel we were in, in the pre-show, we were talking about games of the year, I guess, in like a sort of a half-year retrospective. Like, I feel like there hasn't been a lot of hot bangers this year that have that are really thrust in that conversation yet. I, I feel I, like Elder, once Elder Ring came out, yeah. I just kind of stopped giving a shit because yeah. that was the one for me. Yeah. That's yeah. It's like, it's like Elden Ring and then everything, but Elden, you know, Elden Ring isn't for everybody, which is probably, you know, where stray comes into the conversation for a lot of people, but there's just, you know, like, uh, yeah, there's just like not a lot of games I'm looking to get back to, to check out like neon white is like the one I keep hearing people talk about that. I really want to indulge in, but I haven't gotten yeah, to that with, yet. With Let's that see. one, since we didn't get a review code for it, and I've already passed the week launch window, I'm like, I'm waiting for sale. I can wait. I've waited this long. I can wait for sale. It's but been about do- five weeks. I can wait forever. <laughs> Your move, <laughs> Neon White. <laughs> Honestly, if it were for the Nintendo Switch wish list, wish list, I probably could, because I'd forget about it if it weren't on my wish mm-hmm. list. That's just how fast games are going. Hell, I'm playing Shining Force 3 right now, out of yeah. all freaking things, and it's like, I don't even care about anything else right now. It's like I can finally play this after you know twenty four fucking years. How are you playing it? Play the- How has this come um, to you? So I've had burns of it and stuff for ages, but mm-hmm. I could never get them to run on my system using all the different tricks, and I never got around to actually trying to do the whole like you know hard drive replace um, the disk drive replacement with yeah, like, yeah, uh, yeah. memory that, that gimmick, yeah. So a friend of mine offered to just take a look at my system. He's like, I don't understand why the disk swap thing won't work or the, the pro replay flash cart won't work for you. It works for literally everybody. <laughs> and I let him borrow for two weeks right before like bit gen. And sure enough, the day before he's like, Hey, if you're coming down for bit gen, your system's running now. You can play the game. So I lost my shit, which is rare these days for me. Um, but it was actually a happy lose of shit. I drove down there, picked it up and I can now play my, official copy of shining force three scenario one like the non-burned copy because i had that but then once i finished playing that i have the fan translations of two and three Mm. that i can use the cartridge to play i just got to be careful with the with the saturn's crappy memory internal memory um i have to basically beat the first game create the second game and do the whole i'm assuming you load the game up from at the very beginning like do you have save memory for the previous game or something and Mm. then once i do that Make sure to copy it to my non-flashed uh, for action replay cart for memory storage, just in case the battery decides to conk out. Because I don't know how long, like how much like that thing sounds got. like a very delicate process. Oh, it is just at least for the memory carryover anyway. But as far as just playing the game's concerned, it's literally a matter of putting in the cartridge while the disc is in there and just starting it. Like yeah. no must, no fuss. Mm. And again, like just to reiterate, like I've wanted to play this game for a really long time it was like to me it's like one of sega's biggest slap in the faces to the u.s for the u.s market is to give them the first of three scenarios and just drop it and then never deal with it later <laughs> i never understood yeah. why they didn't well i think you could make a guess as to like how well the saturn was doing in the u.s oh no no, no don't get me wrong the sad the saturn i get the saturn yeah. went under but even back then i was like well i'm sure somewhere down the line they're gonna port it or something yeah, no, a lot, of, a lot of Saturn stuff never saw non-Saturn release. It's, it's, it's wild. It's a, it's a bevy of Saturn. games. Which is why, like, like a lot yeah. of people, <laughs> dear God. Which is why like when a lot of people talk about these like mini consoles and whatnot, a lot, I've heard a lot of people clamor for a Saturn version, specifically because unlike the PlayStation that got one, most of the, like you said, most of the games never left the Saturn. So... It would be a really cool thing to see. Like, we can actually play these fuckers now. Yeah, it has <laughs> a lot of games that are really unique to the system. Unique. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're not just talking bug here, folks. <laughs> we might not be even talking about bug at all. We probably should. <laughs> <No. laughs> Do we talk about Gex? No. Actually, I think that was, Gex that was is on, on multi platforms, yeah. though. Oh, yeah. I right. entered the Gecko on PS1. Yeah, no, I was thinking of 3DO, actually. My bad. Yeah. No. no. <laughs> yes. CDI Mini. mini. Oh, God. I would love it. No, why? You want to play butchered <laughs> copies of Nintendo properties? Yes, yeah. I own a, I own a CDI. It's right here in my corner. <laughs> I'm, I'm cuddling it right now. Yeah. <laughs> as I do before I fall asleep every night. Enjoying I have of to evil. ask: Was it for completionist's sake that you owned it, or were or are some games that you specifically are like? Even, you know, I have fond memories and loving this game. And even and better, I won it in a uh, house party gaming tournament. Oh, that is oh. fantastic! So yes, had, both fantastic, and it makes me feel better because you got it for free, but it, with yeah. effort. Yeah, I mean it wasn't expensive back then, so it was but it was still a prize. It was the main it was the grand prize. But uh, yeah, it was a So what did uh, the winner a... get? We <laughs> 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 actually um but yeah, it was a it was a gaming tournament of increasingly uh absurd like gaming challenges in two thousand six. What did you have to so. do? Um, I don't remember all of it, but I, I can tell you some of it. Um, like a fever dream. I can't remember any of it. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. So uh, I remember three of the games. Uh, one of them was... Okay, so the, it was teams of two, right? And um, so I and and the other person uh, you know, won, and we got to split the prize. Um, so I got the CDI out of that. It was the... <laughs> I actually what did they get? It, did you cut it with half with a chainsaw? You get half. No. You get the less half say, of it. Uh, probably still be a fully functioning CDI. The other person got a, like, really special edition, like, Oregon Trail 2 or something like that with, like, a wooden box and stuff. Oh, wow. I don't That's know, okay. Weird, weird little right. collector's item. Nice. Um, anyway, so one of the games was to play Bushido Blade on the PlayStation, right? So that's, you know, a fighting game with, with Bushidos where they got weapons. And, like, it's famous for having, like, one-hit kills. Like, the swords uh-huh. really will just kill you because they're swords. Yep. Um, so it's it's supposed to be a pretty zippy fighting game because, again, you can just murder each other immediately. Uh, the thing is that the person holding the PlayStation controller playing Bushido Blade had to sit facing away from the television. <laughs> the other player had to direct those people on where to go and what to do using PictoChat on the DS. <laughs> <laughs> could, That's amazing! Wow. You, cannot, you could not speak to the person, but you could draw anything. You can whatever got Holy them shit. the instructions. That yeah. is incredible. Yeah, that so is that was, an amazing wow. thing. That was a great game, yeah. Um, the How other many one, instructions were drawn with dicks? <laughs> I mean, probably all it of them. It was Dicto Chat, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of Dicto Chat at that house party. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we were wild back then. Um, <laughs> there's another game where you and a, a second player, this is a one-on-one, and it was uh, where two players had to do a death match in one of the armored cores that's on PlayStation 2. I don't remember which armored core is on PlayStation 2. But that uh so that game famously has a feature where every single button including every directional button can be completely remapped to whatever you want. And so both players had to kill each other, but the controllers had completely random configurations. <laughs> so who who made them who made them randomize? Uh, the, the the people in charge of, of who set it all up. The, the tournament organizer. Were they yes. the Ooh. same for each player? At least no, Ooh. no, 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 no. No, well, someone could have had a not. better random layout than the other. Yeah, absolutely. But I promise you, they did not. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was like left to jump and like A to move backwards and you know like L two to move forward and it's like it's just completely bonkers and like so you had to sit there and learn the control meanwhile and the the stage you know they set them up the robots up with the brightest colors in like a fairly short stage so it's like you can see the guy right there and all you have to do is get out your gun and kill him who's gonna it's figure it out first <laughs> it's interesting in that i feel like as the person watching the game i'd be extremely entertained but as the person trying to figure out the buttons i'd be frustrated as shit yeah i definitely think i i 
lost that one. We won the Bushido Blade one. Uh, but then there was another one where, uh, a, a, again, a controller thing. But uh, we were using the PlayStation 1 fishing rod controller to play Soul <laughs> Calibur 2, where every okay. input... Oh. <laughs> would uh every input would perform a combo attack in the game so like really op power combo like attacks like actually looking like you know really good gameplay but it's just waving a fishing rod around until you win was there <laughs> wait that wasn't on dreamcast uh no it was on playstation there's a playstation fishing controller yes and uh oh, and soul shit. caliber again soul caliber could be completely remapped to where you can like do full combos just by like pushing a directional button oh, yeah. or something oh, yeah. yeah i just i didn't realize there was a fishing controller sony play. playstation yeah. bass landing video game with fishing controller god damn it i have been missing out 40 bucks on amazon nice you can you can click, 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 click. <laughs> i mean as a person who owns like hori controllers like that's not bad <laughs> I would I would snap yeah, that that's up. Not, that's not bad at all. But yeah, th- those are three of the games. Um, I can't remember most of the others. Uh, there were definitely th- they were all like that though. Like it was just ludicrous. Well, um, I think you made out with the prize because that Oregon Trail two thing you could get on eBay for like thirty bucks. Thank God. <laughs> How much is a CDI on eBay? E- eBay. eBay. Oh God. Um, I think they're like five hundred now, something like that. Wow. Plus, mine has the uh, the. Mine has the extra RAM for playing videos. It's like the video RAM or something like that. It's this big cartridge that goes in the back that lets it play like the Hulk Hogan game, um, Thunder in Paradise, and uh, and yeah, that thing itself is also very expensive. Thunder in Paradise. Someone's oh, selling yeah. one with a couple of games for four hundred. Cool. What games? <laughs> God, let's see. Oh, I have to zoom in on the picture. This uh, is the kind of riveting content that people tune oh, in. There's oh, there's some Sesame like, oh, Street. Wow. There's some Paint School. Uh, nice. Best I searched neighborhood CDI ever. And first, first thing that came up was Thunder in Paradise for $185 fucking dollars. <laughs> we, are, we are truly living outside of God's grace. You, uh, <laughs> you could get Hulk Hogan for less than that. But you don't want him. No, you don't. Not at all. Rather have interactive television. That's something he says in the intro to, to Thunder in Paradise, when he's describing what's going to happen in the game, which is just, it's just a, a, a light gun shooter where, you know, it's, it's a Mad Dog McCree kind of game. All right. So it's yeah. terrible. Yeah. It's terrible, terrible, but it's good for CDI. <laughs> That's <laughs> like, not saying how much. Uh, no, it's, exactly. it never is saying much, but yet the thing you have to understand about CDI, if you've played enough of the games, is that those bad Zelda and Mario games, those are the good games. <laughs> <laughs> Relatively yes, yes, I, don't think I, I don't know if I needed to know that. That just terrifies me even more to know what I missed out on. Like yeah. I played those games, and that's like, all I needed to play. Everything else is just like, you know, like you got some edutainment stuff, like you got, you know, and you got movies. Uh, Todd Rundgren put out a CD on CDI for some reason. <laughs> uh, Peter Gabriel put out a music video that you could edit. All right. It's it's bad. I, that is I the future of games a, right there. Yeah. I just remember being a kid, and they actually had that set up in front of a Boscow's department store trying to entice people to buy the system. Like, hey, you know, you remember Zelda? Well, it's right here on the Philips CDI. You want to come check it out? We're like, yeah. You play it like, the I, fuck is this? Honestly, though, I mean, they, they couldn't have just gotcha people into buying those things like by letting them play them. I mean, they were marketed as like these big multimedia extravagant things for like home theater setups because they cost like 700 bucks when they came when they were new. Like they were luxury saying. items. That's what I'm saying. That's literally what they tried to do. They, yeah. they set up the system in front of the store with Zelda running on it. <laughs> and when I, you walked by, they talked you, they talked you into coming and try it out. And it's uh, easy to do because again, it's Zelda. Everyone likes Zelda. And you boot it up. You literally are looking at it going, what the fuck is this game? <laughs> this is not Zelda. And they're like, well, it's only going to cost you, you know, your two front teeth and your entire Christmas budget. You want one? Like I will pay you to turn this thing off. <laughs> this is yeah. a terrible device. I but, feel like I don't know. I I don't know how they tried to sell them back in the day, but I really don't think they tried to sell them on like screenshots of Zelda CDI. But I don't know. Maybe they did. It was the early nineties, like so it was. But things like here's the thing: like, can you recall seeing it in a game magazine though? Because uh, to be truthful, aside from seeing it at that store, 
I've never seen it in like a magazine. It's like, here's an ad for the Philips CDI. It was just I saw, I a stare, thing. I, there was ads in EGM. EGM advertised it. Absolutely. I would. Yeah. I would like to see those because I don't. I do not remember. I, I am sure there 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 was. I mean, I know they talked about the games in there. Wow. Oh, that, that, I, I believe you heard about it. Yeah. Because like that, that's just, just the way it is for them. But like, I just I don't remember any ads and stuff like that. But even when they talked about, it, I was like, this, these games don't look appealing. Like, there's nothing about this that makes me go. I need to beg my parents for this <laughs> system, and I begged my parents for a Turbo Duo. So oh, I can go. Yeah, a, a, a two p- is is this is yes for uh, seventh guest on the CDI. You won't believe your CDIs. Oh, actually, Whoa. yeah. There's a couple other games here too: Dragon's Lair and Mad Dog McCree. Nineties puns. Get out. Yeah, it was all about the 3DO and Road Rash. I remember seeing that in a store and playing that, punching the guys left and right, and being like, "Wow, this is not worth eight hundred dollars." <laughs> that freaking system they wish yeah the, yeah there was there's a there's a ton of print ads for cdi games the only thing i remember on 3do was dennis miller that's news to me which was uh <laughs> that's hot a off game. The, yeah that was a, that was dennis miller at the height of his fame having done weekend update uh and stuff doing just like his one-liners about news stories on on the 3do <laughs> that sounds literally awful. Is, it is is bad. Speaking of things that are awful, we should talk about our games <laughs> <laughs> review for tonight. Oh, that yeah. worries me. <laughs> dun, dun, should we dun. get to reviews? You, I'm definitely I, wondering what, a, what Tim's reviewing now. <laughs> oh, it's <laughs> That's, not that, that lead it. It's fine. I'm just, uh, it's Sticky Bear Math for CDI. Anyone play that? Anyone want to learn? <laughs> oh, math? you're reviewing <laughs> Sticky Bear Math. I've heard good things about that. Funny. First game to talk like... about is Sticky Bear Math. <laughs> I, 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 I guarantee you, I would not come anywhere near something called Sticky Bear. <laughs> well, also, you know, I, if he's sticky, I would not come near it, and I hope you were intent. I hope you intentionally said that, uh, <laughs> unless it was like Sticky Bear, like gives you a large sum of money and then walks away uh, slowly without Sticky making bear. any sudden moves as you get into your car and pull away. Sticky Bear cuts you a check. The game. <laughs> Sounds like a terrible that nickname shit. for a thug. What's up, Sticky Bear? Sticks you with the that knife. Shit. That shit would bounce. You know why they call me Sticky Bear? Because I, I like know. honey. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's, the, that's that new way to pull me. What are we talking about? All right, yeah, let's get to reviews. First game to talk about tonight is <laughs> Train Valley, developed by Flasm, published by Blitworks, released July 27th on Xbox One, Switch, and PS4 for eleven ninety nine. dollars Build railroads in order to connect cities, tunnels, and bridges. New railways are cheap when laid across bare fields, but can be expensive when demolishing forests, villages, and other existing structures. Manage increasing traffic by constructing switches, sidings, and spurs so that multiple trains can run without delays at the same time tim what's going on in train valley um well okay so to note this is a uh, train valley console edition uh which is i think an important distinction to make because this game has uh originates from the personal computer side of things um yeah it's a cool little like pretty compact like railroad sim game uh like i reviewed railway empire like last year which is a much more complicated game i thought uh in adapting something to switch in like kind of the scope of its scenarios uh and the level of detail into your train tracks and like laying down different signals and such um it was very it was very confusing and hard to get into um this is much more uh simple uh, of a game, uh, you'll be dropped in, into a scenario. The scenarios are, uh, just on like one screen. So you can kind of see everything all at once, uh, at least as as things begin. So it's much more manageable. Um, you have to, you will have different stations, uh, where you, and you lay out the tracks, uh, and a train will appear to station say, yo, I, I am currently here at station blue. I need to take some shit over to station red. Uh, and you need to get that train from there to there, uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, because the longer you take, the more value will denigrate from the, your load that you're trying to ship. Um, and you have to get the train there without crashing, which is, you know, real easy as things start when you only have a couple depots to worry about but then you know as a 
uh, stage will move on, you will like more cities will pop up and it's like, okay, now I have cities like green and yellow and purple and orange um, and other places where things need to ship around. And that's where things get increasingly complicated uh, as you have to find ways to logically, you know, kind of craft the skeleton of your railroad system uh, and take and control all of the different switches on the tracks, which you will control manually uh, to make sure the trains get to where they need to go and don't uh, crash into each other in a fiery blaze. Uh, It goes through, there's five scenarios in this game. Uh, Well, they they just, they take place in like different parts of the world uh, at different times in the world. So technology will advance as as you play forward. Uh, Naturally, the most trained, the most advanced train technology does not exist in the United States of America. Uh, It's, it's in Japan Um, (laughs) as you move along, but um, it's mostly uh, in terms of this, it doesn't. Doesn't really add like it's just you know it's just kind of a different backdrop for for where you're laying tracks and stuff and like different technologies can can uh you know be can have different properties but the you know the the settings are just kind of like that it, it's you know that those unto themselves don't really add anything terribly hyper specific um anyways so each uh kind of scenario has like five different stages to six different stages to it. Uh, as you like, each stage will have its own little sub goals, which can involve uh, not crashing trains, making sure trains, no trains go to the wrong depot, uh, spending a certain amount of money, demolishing a certain amount of things, which is a funny one. I'm just like, you think you'd be incentivized for not uh, destroying shit in the name of uh, your expansion, but <laughs> nope, not the case. Sometimes it's like, yeah, you need to destroy like a hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff while you're <laughs> you need to be sloppy you need to you know use those eminent domain laws to just <laughs> run railroads through people's fucking houses uh sure whatever uh so but yeah this this is a game adapted from pc and this is where uh there's kind of some ups and downs because now you're playing on a controller instead of like i think playing this game on a mouse uh, with, or with a mouse on a PC is is probably a lovely experience. Playing it on a controller on a TV, uh, it starts off okay. The first thing I'll say right off the bat is that the cursor is very small. Now you're not dragging the cursor around the screen like it didn't just. You're not just like dragging it with the analog stick. Um, basically, what you'll do is, is there is, and this is not terribly well explained i should also add that and like some of the tutorial messages when you start just whiz by so fast i'm just saying wait what did that what did that say wait what does that mean i don't understand why are you why are you telling me so much all at once and telling it to me so fast i don't understand yet but after you know i kind of got frustrated and like restarted the level and took it and then yeah just folded over the things that i did pick up with the things that i didn't i i figured it out uh but basically at any given time you can have selected your uh the switches which is where, you know, tracks meet and you need to direct trains going one direction or another direction. Um, you can have the trains themselves selected. So if you see one uh, that's going to crash or is it going the wrong way, you can pause that train and redirect it and have it just turn around, which is funny because the engine, just, <laughs> the train doesn't back up. Just the engine magically jumps to the other side of the train and starts going in that direction. Um you can uh, lay down tracks. Um, you can select your stations. Uh, and let's, I think the, I feel like there's another one. I know there's a button. Like if you just hit the uh, left trigger, it adds, it will add a train ready to go in one of your stations, which is just basically a way, like that has a monetary cost to it. Uh, kind of the goal of each level rotates around, uh, you know, building up a certain amount of money and like, buying trains and building tracks and, and doing certain things will, you know, cost money and, and doing demo also costs money. Uh, so you can choose to launch a train early, which will make things more complicated, but you'll get more money faster. Uh, also real easy to just accidentally smack the left trigger and suddenly you have more trains in your stations than you were planning on. There's no way to undo that. Uh, <laughs> and there's no thing that says like, Oh, are you sure you want to add a train? That seems like a prompt that maybe should have been there. 
but it's like you know you you use the uh left and right bumpers to switch between these kind of control focuses but every time you do that it's like okay well where is my cursor where is my cursor now and it's like this little white arrow uh and it could sometimes it's right where it needs to be and sometimes it's like okay well it's you know which station is it on and i'm kind of bouncing between them till i catch sight of it it's like oh there it is um you know again you're not dragging between them like when you select stations it'll just go automatically you know from one to the next to the next to the next um which led to me making very liberal use of the pause feature of the game which i'm not sure is something that you would have used quite as much on pc if you were like getting overwhelmed you can toggle the speed of the game uh to three different levels just to kind of move things along things are very slow on the slowest level um but i you know just to to play the game like with the speed of moving around these cursors and putting in commands with a controller or lack thereof there was a lot of like pausing and then fidgeting around to be like okay well there's a train ready to go so i want to start that train i have to build some track there's this train over here i have to hit these switches over there and then go and then it's like oh wait i missed this switch over here so i have to stop that train and reverse it and move it back and then this train over here is doing this thing and i have to do that and it ends up being a lot of stop and go rather than kind of a more natural flow to the game and also, once you get to a point where you have, you know, six different cities and you have, you know, all these sections of train track out there and you'll have like maybe like a couple dozen uh, junctions you need to control and all these trains out there, it really bogs down the flow of the game and it becomes very cumbersome to manage with a controller just because... There is, I, I think in having you kind of flip between the four things, you're only really controlling one thing at once. Like that is a way of managing it and pausing the game is also a way of managing it. And these are all things that appear to be in the PC version, just looking at screenshots. But it's like, you have to lean on that so heavily and it doesn't, like it, it just turns into work. And it, it was definitely like a certain point where, you know, I'm on a stage and I'm just like trying to lay some track. And it's like, you know, it has to, you know, as I'm dragging the cursor over, it has to go over every section of track. And then I need to go up here to build up here. And it's just like, it's losing its, you know, kind of Zen flow that I think the game uh, would have a lot stronger feel for on PC. Um, I would, I don't know if this came out on Switch as well. I'd be curious to try it out on there when you have the touchscreen available. But, um, yeah, like mechanically, I, I think it's good. I think kind of the scope of it um, and like the challenge, the thing you're managing are all good. It's just that crossover from PC to a more limited control scheme, I think really hurts it and makes it a lot less fun than I think it should be, <laughs> unfortunately. No. Well, it is available on the Switch. I don't know if yeah. it has touch screen capabilities mm -hmm. or not but it is available on there it is 12 bucks what are your thoughts on yeah. it yeah i don't think it's bad i think it's probably in in the try it i would give it the try it level of recommendation um but it, you know it looks like a game that's not going to push a pc so if, if you're interested in it i think it would be more you'd be better off checking it out on there um then and there's also a sequel out on the PC as well that came out like a couple months ago. Ooh. Uh, yeah, this original came out back in 20 fucking 15. Is that right? Yeah, 2015. Um, but yeah, the sequel came out more recently. But I, I just have to feel I have to think that like controlling this with a mouse would just be so 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 much easier <laughs> than fumbling around with a controller. Uh, unfortunately, the you know, it runs well, you know, it looks nice. Uh, it's just that cursor could definitely be bigger. And I looked in the options menu and the only thing that was in there was like sound options. And I'm just, that is uh, not what I wanted, unfortunately, but yeah. All right. Well, that is it right. for you. Uh, yep. I'm going to go night, night. Oh, so teepee. So teepee. Nighty night time. Yeah. Couldn't fall asleep last night. And then there was a thunderstorm. So dogs jumped into bed uh, and under the bed, which was really funny because the dog got stuck under the bed and couldn't like get out. Oh no. Um, 
No, she's an idiot. She it's just like <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a hard. It's okay when it's dumb. <laughs> yeah, it's it's okay oh. when it's dumb. Um, and it's it's just like you you dummy because the it's a hardwood floor and she couldn't quite get like the grip to like pull herself out. Um, she couldn't quite get the leverage, so I had to like grab her and yoink her out this morning. <laughs> Uh, oh. hey, you know when there's thunder and lightning you know you just you gotta duck and cover uh, and, just uh, goes to show you though she couldn't get back out but when she was scared she made it happen oh yeah she got yeah you slid right under there all right you guys have a good night all I'll right take care tim you later. next game to talk about is captain velvet meteor the jump plus dimensions release or uh developed by momo pie game studio published by shui Sh- Shuisha Games, I hope I said that right, released July 28th on Switch for $24.99. Damien's life is flipped upside down when his family moves him to Japan. A shy boy, he copes with his newfound loneliness with the power of his infinite imagination and creates an imaginary hero named Captain Velvet Meteor. In his imaginary world, Damien sets off on an adventure with his favorite Jump Plus heroes and fights to adjust to his new home and find himself... Now, what is going on in Captain Velvet Meteor, the Jump Plus Dimensions? So, this game is actually a lot less complicated than I really expected it to be. Um, the premise of this is that your main character's family just moved from, I want to say, Europe, someplace in Europe, to Japan. And he's actually very, he feels very displaced and lonely because he left his friends behind and whatnot. And he's just kind of trying to get adjusted to his current new abode, his house. So the game pretty much takes place with you walking around your house, whether it be like, you know, to talk to you, go, you know, make sure your dog's okay during a certain event or to fulfill some requests that your mom gave you on like a list of tasks that you need to fulfill. All involve you walking around your house and investigating your house, just like looking at various objects and saying, hey, here's my manga collection. Here's my poster. But every time you can come across one of the things that your mom wants you to do, your anxiety levels kind of build up because, again, he just feels really out of place and alone. And then at this moment, he kind of goes into a bit of an uh, imagination fever dream and he goes into the, his other, the other world, which is the world of Captain Velvet Meteor. And what ends up happening there is it's a fantasy world of his own creation because obviously he's a child with an imagination, in which case... Him on an adventure, his ship crash lands on a mysterious planet, and he needs to find a way to repair his ship and get off the planet by locating a bunch of power cores that are hidden located around the planet. But of course, you know, being the nature of the game, those power cores correspond to the different things in his home that he's feeling anxious about. And each situation that he encounters involves a new, you know, final villain or something. For example, one of the tasks involves a... His mom saying, go out and change the laundry on the balcony. So when he goes out there, he kind of goes into like an imagination station mode. And he imagines the laundry machine as being like this weird, like giant flaming, like laundry machine that's going to fight him at the end of the stage. Um, so in each of these scenarios, also, he ends up coming across one of his from his one of the characters from his manga that he loves to collect in the form of you know characters from Jump Map, Jump Come manga. Which is funny because this was me learning how freaking old I am because despite the fact that I still do watch anime and I still do try to keep up with stuff here and there, I only recognize one of like the seven characters in this game. (laughs) So I've got I've got a lot of characters to learn about. But now I am going to watch Spy Across Family because there's a character from that game or from that manga that's in this game. Um, so what ends up happening is he teams up with, in each of these scenarios, he ends up teaming up with one of the jump characters to go through a series of stages to ultimately combat the final boss, which in turn will allow him to, you know, get a better understanding of his situation. Like, oh, okay, this isn't so bad after all. After he resolves it in his imaginary world, he's able to come to grips with it in the real world, too. Uh, and this is where it gets interesting, though, because the gameplay in this, there's no equipment, there's no stats, there's nothing you typically come to expect from a tactical, you know, game, a tactical game. But what this does offer is an interesting way to play, which I would like to see come up in more complicated games in the future. So each character in the game, in each chapter, is only Tate Damien and the one jump character. So you'll never have like a party of like four or five people. But what ends up happening is each character has their own basic attack, uh, which can either be firing a bullet forward 
or like attacking in a, a different pattern, like either a, a plus sign or a cross sign or whatever. Some of the attacks will have the character dash forward. Other char- attacks will have the character stay in place or whatever. Just different ways that the characters end up interacting with their combat attacks. There's also a combo attack, like a basic combo attack, where if one is standing next to the other, depending on which partner, which character Damien is partnered up with, or I'm sorry, who Captain Velvet Meteor is partnered up with, it'll determine the type of combo attack they have. Like some levels, you need to like use a special ability to like make light appear to reveal certain hidden objects. So the combo attack will be you know, Velvet Meteor launching his gun up in the air to fire a volley, which lights the area around it to reveal shadows or fake objects or whatever. And then the partner character will do like a quick blast. This has a large range of damage. It can, uh, a large range of like space it can attack, but does low damage. And the other attacks, of course, the ones that are just like smaller patterns do more damage. As you defeat enemies, depending on the way in which you defeat them, you'll gain two resources. You'll gain like these little green orbs, which will allow you to add on to your basic level of movement points. So if you can start out with four, but you've banked, like, say, five of them, you can walk five extra spaces with whatever character you want. Or make one of them walk three spaces and the other walk two extra spaces on top of their basic four. Um, and the other collectible are these golden orbs that if you can collect three of them, you'll charge up their super combo attack. In which case, if they're standing next to each other, they'll do a special attack depending on who's with Captain Meteor. For example, one character might just set a huge space on fire and everybody that's in that space will catch fire and take damage. Um, The other one might be one where the character goes into the ground as a shadow, summons all the monsters nearby, and then comes up and does like a huge spinning attack and just kills everybody. What it basically ends up happening with this game and the way it's designed is that battles are quick and snappy. Um, you have to pretty much just like hit guys, take them out, move forward, hit guys, take them out, because most of the time enemies are going to die in one or two hits. It's intended to be that way. Uh, I kind of came to like that. In fact, there's not even the health is a little different in this game. There's no health pickups either. If you take damage. The way you get health back is to kill as many things as you can as fast as you can, because when you kill guys, you get health back. So again, it's all emphasis on punching forward. Um, Every once in a while, you'll come across an optional objective on the board. If you fulfill that optional objective, you'll get a little tick box, like a little star on the screen. Each set of missions has two optional objectives. And another thing you can find in a special chest in certain areas is like a little musical note, which gives you music that you can listen to in the sound test. There's two of those in every set of missions, too. Um, it's interestingly enough, it's a fairly straightforward game. And I, I should probably mention the bingo board too, which isn't <laughs> much in particular, but still, uh, as you're exploring the real world, every once in a while you'll come across a sticker. Like you might investigate like the freaking latrine or whatever. And go, Oh boy, a sticker. Why is there a sticker in a latrine? I have no freaking clue, but you can find one there. Uh, and it's like a four by four grid in the main menu. If you can fill, if you can find stickers that form a longing, you'll unlock a bingo mission, which is generally in the form of like replaying, you know, bosses from the main game, but under special conditions and stuff like that. Just more ways to enjoy the game and have fun with it. I feel like in the end, this game wasn't what I was expecting it to be. But what I got was still something that I found to be fairly entertaining. Um, It'll be a quick run through in a sense in the form of like, again, I don't see too many people getting really stumped on this game, except for maybe the occasional optional mission. But I think that was also the intent. It was meant to be a game that can be played by anybody, young or old. But I kind of liked him going on these little missions and having a conversation with the jump characters and seeing this little world he writes for himself. Because in the world, he even acts like he doesn't know the other. Like, who are you? Like, I am such and such. Ushio Mushime, the person who likes to dig, dig in the sand. Whatever. We're stuck in a time loop. Let's get out of here. Um, it's like having these like cool adventures and these cool dialogues with the characters. I had a good time playing the game. And I think if you if you decide you want to take it on, knowing that you're not getting into this like deep tactical adventure, you may find yourself having a good time too, reminiscent of days when you got little, you know, got your imagination running as you were walking around the house or in your backyard or whatever. Well, the game's twenty five bucks. What do you think about it? I think it's a buy. It. I had a good time playing it. Just know, like I said, just know going in, this isn't your typical, you know, build stats and level up, whatever. Just go on and just have a little bit of fun with it. Something different. Cool. 
All right, next up is Cubite Classics Thunderbolt Collection by Pico, developed by Pico Interactive, published by Cubite Interactive, released August 4th on Xbox One, Series X and S, Switch, PS4, and PS5 for $7.99. Your goal is simple, destroy all the enemies that will come until you reach the final boss of the stage. Make it easier and faster as you collect items and power-ups to enhance your health bar, increase your speed, and upgrade or acquire new weapons. You'll lead humanity to survival. Chris, tell us about Thunderbolt Collection by Pico. Okay, well, Thunderbolt Collection by Pico. This is a very... Uh, Pico has really... Uh, every time they come out with something new, I am scratching my head. I'm like, really? This? <laughs> like, this is coming back from the dead? Like, of all the things. Um, this one is especially, like, weird. So, uh, fair warning to anybody who is expecting me to talk a whole lot about this game. There's not a whole lot to say about the game, so I'm actually going to talk more about the history of, of this and, like, what surrounds it. Um, and then I'll talk about the game. But, uh, yeah, Thunderbolt is a collection of two games. Uh, one initially released, quote-unquote, in 1993, and the other one released in 1995 uh, on the NES and Sega Genesis, respectively. Now, I say released in quotes because these are uh, they were unlicensed games at the time. Uh, they were uh, developed and published by Gamtech, or Gametech. It's like G-A-M-T-E-C. Uh, which is a company that I, I have conflicting reports on the internet that they're either a Chinese company or a Taiwanese company. Um, sorry, I don't know. But uh, they came out with some just like, you know, like those kind of hidden gem, you know, unreleased things or, un you know, um, unlicensed things that like uh, some of which are actually really good and some of which you like actually probably have seen even though they were doomed to obscurity from the start <laughs> um but the two the the two games that are in this collection are actually both called thunderbolt 2 um even though the the re-release doesn't say so um or this this collection doesn't say so yeah thunderbolt 2 on the nes was you know 93 and thunderbolt 2 on the genesis was 95 completely different not completely different games but they are different games um so yeah, is there the, a Thunderbolt one? Not that I know of. <laughs> I don't. I mean, you'd have to ask them. Like again, the, the information. This is one of those kind of companies where information is sketchy at best. Uh. However, I could tell you that I really hope now that the the genie has been let out of the bottle for Game Tech or Gam Tech. Uh, that we will see some of their other games, which I actually, for the purposes of this review, like loaded up some of my flashcards and started playing <laughs> because uh they came out with some like interesting stuff they came out with a sega genesis based um chippendale rescue rangers ripoff called squirrel king um it basically plays like chippendale but the thing is that they'll rip off other games but then make like their own assets and music and it's actually pretty good uh, they also came out with Magical Girl featuring Ling Ling the Little Witch, which is a bright and colorful shmup with a uh, with a witch character that's basically it plays just like Thunderbolt. And uh, and I'm like, why why didn't we get this? Let's get this. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite ones is another. Um, it's basically a uh, it's a ripoff of Fantasy Zone. Which uh, you know is another unlicensed uh, Genesis game called Adventurous Boy. <laughs> so uh, wow. yeah, we could have had Adventurous Boy and Magic Girl, and I would be talking a whole different review here. Oh, well, maybe that'll um, be next. But how, I how did so. this one turn out? Well, okay, so the two games are extremely similar. Is the thing? Uh, it's basically you know they they were right to just call it. This is the eight bit mode of this game. This is the sixteen bit mode of this game. Um, you play as a little ship, and you fly around and uh, pick up power ups. It's a lot like a uh, soldier blade, or sh yeah, soldier blade, or like a um, maybe even a Raiden type of situation. Um, you have a life bar as well as lives, so it's pretty generous for for a shmup of this uh, of this caliber or this like era. So it's it's fairly playable. Uh, the only thing really about it is that. It's it's weirdly inconsistent in how it performs because like bullets in this game, for instance, you know the the thing that you're most concerned about in a shmup, um, 
they move silky smooth, like could be 60 frames a second. I don't even know. Like you can, the, the bullets are moving just fine. Backgrounds moving just fine. Sometimes in parallax, looking pretty good. Um, music, I can't even tell. <laughs> um, and there's no way to equalize. Like you can't raise the music volume and lower the game volume. So, um, you know, I tried blasting it, but yeah, this this is not the, a hard rock soundtrack or anything like that. Um, but anyways, bullets move real smooth. Enemies move like they're frame skipping. They're like fast and they're just kind of like, eh, 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 eh. you know, like <laughs> they're moving like, like you would expect to see in a like pirated or bootlegged type of video game. So it's like on one hand, it runs really well. And on the other hand, it's kind of like it shows kind of shows where it's from in terms of that. So some people might be put off by that. I personally actually really like playing the games. Um, the power-ups are okay. Uh, you've got your typical, you know, straightforward shot that gets more powerful, and, you know, it's a bunch of bullets that just go, like, uh, you know, straight. And uh, then you get, like, your spread shot that, like, spreads out wider as you get more power-ups, and you got your uh, this weird, like, curly laser that, you know, I don't even mess with that one. <laughs> And, uh, of course, you have your one button for shooting, your one button for bombs. You get through the stages, and you fight the boss at the end, and, you know, just keep repeating um, until you win. And the the Genesis version has little bits of story, like, between... And I do mean little bits. Sometimes the, the story, quote-unquote, is just, like, a sentence fragment. <laughs> it's just, like... Uh, it's very minimal in that respect. In fact, I would like to read... The uh, I would like to read the description of Thunderbolt 2 on the NES uh, as given by Moby Games, which is where you can find out like this obscure information for the most part, uh, because it is the most generic shmup description I've ever heard, like read in my life. Do you want to hear it? Yes. Thunderbolt 2 is a vertically scrolling top-down shooter set in space. The introduction shows how Earth is attacked from outer space. The player controls a spaceship through three levels, each one with a boss. The ship can be freely moved around the screen, and it has an unlimited amount of bullets. The ship has three lives, but additional ones can be earned by destroying enemies. Destroyed opponents leave behind power-ups that provide weapon upgrades with new bullet patterns as well as bomb icons that clear the entire screen right away when they are picked up. Enemies typically appear in waves with different patterns. Ooh, That's it. fancy. So there you go. That that times two. That's the collection. Nice. Well, it's eight bucks. What do you say? I am going to say that there are, you know, this is like one of those things where it's like you could have one really good arcade conversion from like, you know, ACA or Hamster or something like that for eight, for exactly eight bucks. Or you could have two games with this Pico collection. <laughs> uh, it, it is kind of that two for one but you know would either of them sell on their own kind of situations uh, as a shmup fan i appreciate this piece of history and therefore i am going to say i'm a fan however i will uh let people know if unless you're just deep in it when it comes to like classic shmups you know give this one a try it or um or purchase it so that maybe they'll release magic girl and adventurous boy <laughs> later on down the line or or uh, actually, the one thing that Game Tech did do that some folks might know is Legend of Wukong, which is a Genesis RPG that they released in 2008. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it's it's one of those that uh, Super Fighter Team released. You know, the guys that that released Beggar Prince. This was like this was their second game to uh. like to kind of bring out on the Genesis after you know the 90s. So, and that's actually really good. It's an RPG based on. Um, on the uh, journey to the West, like everything is. Oh, well, maybe and, that'll uh, be in the future. I hope so. I would like to see that one. So, like, yeah, you know, go check out Game Tech and their weird little games. And, uh, <laughs> you know, this one may be too while you're at it. All right. Next up is Mojito the Cat, developed by GTZA Studio, published by Red Deer Games, released July 15th on the Switch for $9.99. Help your child or yourself grow logical skills alongside cute animals. Take your time and look around the map for the best routes. Make sure to consider all possibilities. Remember, gravity is not an issue if you have the right mindset. Uh, Chris and Purnell, both of you played this one. Who wants to start? This is a Chris joint. Uh, okay. I'll start. Okay. Chris, tell us about All Mojito right. the Cat. Mojito the Cat is a... Um, so this is a 3D puzzle game 
where you basically are a, I suppose you're a cat. <laughs> kind of looks like it could be a hamster. Could be just about. It's a it's a block. A block. You're a of, cat. Of it, thing. It, it says mojito the cat. You're a cat. Yeah, it, it's it's a cat. It's you're a cat. Cat. You use one of the other of animals. Yes, you're an abstract representation of a cat. Thank you. Um. So yeah, you pick out these blocky stages. And basically, it puts you in, and you are to um, kind of roll around the stage in a certain amount of movements. Uh, the goal is to pick up a dead fish, literally a skeleton of a fish, and then get to this, like, ring, a blue ring that's at the end of the stage. And along the way, you can pick up different things. Um, if you pick up all the things, then, you know, this is one of those kind of games that grades you on, like, a one to three points you know, at the end of the stage. Uh, one is to complete the stage. Two is to collect all the things in the stage. And then three is to use the allotted amount of movements that the game wants you to use. Uh, um, I'm terrible at yeah. games like that. Oh, I know. I mean, it does start off pretty easy, but, like, eventually, you know, there's, there's like, what, six different worlds? And maybe there's another one that's unlocked. I don't know. But, like, you can see, like, kind of previews of those worlds if you're not there yet. And they get... And there's one on the title screen, too. They get elaborate. Uh, yeah, the store yeah, page says the that there's 60 puzzles to solve. Uh, the store page also has two uses of unique. One where it says wow. that you can experience all of the unique worlds alongside Mojito. And also unique. says that the key features include 11 unique 3D cube skins. Unique. They are, yeah. And they are locked away, let me tell you. Um... <laughs> So they, um, yeah, you can, you can like unlock these guys and like, you know what they're going to be. It's like, except maybe GTZA. I don't know what that means, but, uh, turtle, panda, penguin. I want penguin, but, uh, maybe the you GTZA get them. GTZA is like the developer skin. Maybe. Uh, but you get them by completing levels. Uh, the first one you can get by finishing 30 levels. Yeesh. Uh, but then it's like, if you get the cub stars, which are like, I guess those, um, those, you know, those prizes at the end of the stage, cause they are yellow cubes. So I imagine they're cube stars or something like that. Uh, but yeah, I, I've only gotten 22 as a record so far, so I have not yet unlocked any of the other skins. I'm sorry. I'm not that good, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's actually, it's, it's pretty cool. Like. I like the uh, I like the look of it, and you know I like me a nice puzzle game. But yeah, the limited movements, you know, you really do have to like think because uh, the way that different um, things in the stages behave. Uh, for instance, there are some blocks you can only go over once. Uh, once you do, they disappear forever, and then you just have to like finish the level. So you know you got to do some planning ahead of time. Uh, you got little elevator type things. You've got blocks that uh, switch around the gravity of the situation. Like they flip the, the whole level on its side or whatever. So now you can travel on its side or like flip it upside down and you can do it that way. Um, yeah, all kinds of stuff in here. And I feel like Purnell should maybe say some stuff now. I was going to say, Purnell, what are your thoughts on it? I feel like the main gripe I have about this game, which is a small one admittedly. Well, I got two gripes. Um, is the fact that in the game you're collect in addition to just getting the cubes or whatever, which is the this game's version of the three star system. You know how much I love those. Um, yeah. Is the fact that uh, when you do unlock animals, it, I was really expecting it to change the pickups to represent the animal. So the game is called Mojito the Cat. You're collecting yarn balls. And you're collecting dead fish to exit the level. I unlock the turtle. I'm playing with the turtles. Like, okay, what will the turtle collect? And what will the turtle have to use to get out of the level? <laughs> nah, the turtle loves yarn balls and dead fish, too. I don't know why. I mean, he's a turtle. <laughs> I don't know why we want those things, but the game doesn't adapt to those things. So the animal skins are pretty much exactly what they are. They're just like skins that don't change other elements. Not a bad thing, per se. I mean, maybe you want to control a, a rhino instead of a cat block. Nah, it's fine. Um... The other issue I have, which just comes with the territory of the games, this is isometric 3D. Uh, I have had more than a few times where no matter how many levels I've played, no matter how much I've done, I'm like, okay, I need to go over here and then roll over here. Whoops, push the wrong direction. <laughs> I guess I just wasted a move. Start the whole level over because I'm not going to end the level without getting three cubes. So uh, it's, it's a problem sometimes where I'm like, nope, got it wrong. Nope, got it wrong. 
I don't know what it is. I think it's just the way I've always been. Like, this isn't old man brain stuff. This is, I've been this way since I was a kid. I used to mention <laughs> 3D movement kicks my ass. Um, oh, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but with that aside, though, I do like the levels in this game. Some of them get pretty wacky as far as, like, how the how the manipulation works. There was one level I liked. It's early on, it, mind you, but it's still, like, the best gimmick I've come across so far, aside from, like, the overall map rotation stuff is the fact that you would walk across a block and then once you stepped off of it it went it just shot down a pole which meant you couldn't oh, yeah. cross over it again but if you inverted the stage and walked on the other side you would have to walk across on that side and then after you're doing that it would kick it back to the other side again so you had to like determine when was the best time to cross the block to create the bridge on the other side when was the best time to ignore it to conserve your movement um this game really makes you think about you know, optimal movements when they start introducing more and more of the gimmicks. And it gets to be pretty rough. Like, they make you work for these freaking cubes. <laughs> but, I, but I like that, too. So it's not a bad thing. Yeah, talking about... <clears throat> excuse me. Talking about, like, minor gripes, uh, some things like, yeah, there's, there's a forced isometric perspective that means that, you know, you have to remember that left is actually going to go up left and right is going to go down, you know, right. Um... And also, like, you can move the camera around a little bit, but you can't fully flip, you can't fully, like, freely move the stage to take a look at your path, nor can you actually flip the stage around with the camera. You actually have to flip the stage around with, like, one of the blocks that lets you do that. And the other thing, I can't figure out, because they, they keep track of your total yarn balls, but I don't know what they're for. That makes two of us. I'm just yeah, like amassing looked, a mass of them. I know. I was like, I'm looking for ways to spend these yarn balls. Yo, I got these yarn balls. I guess Mojito the cat's <laughs> a bit of a hoarder. <laughs> Keep <laughs> all the balls. Or else we're going to end up with some real cool sweaters by the end of this thing. Oh. <laughs> well, Mojito the cat wants you to play. Well, the yeah. game is 10 bucks. Uh, if you're on the Switch, which the game is on the Switch, we're talking about it here. Uh, not sure how long the sale is lasting, but it is a whopping $1.99. Well, then that answers that. Yeah. Pick I mean, it up. That's a, it's a fuck it, why not at $1.99. For $10, I'm going to say try it, but it, it is solid. Like, the, the thinking part of it's solid. It's just there's some weird... There's just some weirdness around it uh, that, you know, you'll either either it'll bother you. It won't, um, you know, but yeah, two dollars is like, yeah, just fuck it. Why not play a puzzle <laughs> game? Ernell, your thoughts at ten bucks at ten bucks? I think it's at least a try, but the try it is primarily because like we were talking about before the control scheme, it can drive you a bit batty if you don't get used to it. And some people might be like me, in which case they'll never get used to it and they'll keep making the mistakes. Yeah. doesn't make the game bad. It just means you'll be having to like constantly tell yourself down is actually left, left and then down. Don't have time. It's, 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 a, it's a lot to just keep in mind. We are trying to maintain effective moves to not go over the limit because the total limit for each level is the exact number of movements you'll need to beat the level. So there's no room for error if you're going for those. But yeah, it's definitely a try, and that's the only reason. If you don't care about this whole isometric thing, and you're hearing this and going, you guys are old fucks. I don't have any problem with this, and it's a but. We are old was calling us old in the chat, yeah. Yeah, Aki was saying we're old. She asked if we piss dust. Here's um, the thing. Aki said it, so it means nothing. Let's move on. <laughs> yeah. All right, next game is Arsonist Heaven. <laughs> Developed by Omega Core, Rattleika Games, and East Asia Soft. Published by East Asia Soft. Released July 27th on Xbox One Series X and S, Switch, PS4, and PS5 for $4.99. Get ready to blaze through your enemies with as much firepower as you can carry. It's Hunter Be Hunted in a game of side scrolling survival. Take the role of a hunter in a flame proof hazard suit and equipped with a jetpack as you traverse a wide variety of biomes from forests and icy mountains to deserts and volcanic caverns. Chris, what is going on in Arsonist Heaven? Okay, well, clearly one of those things where somebody, you know, thought of a title and they were like, oh, we got to make this game. And then East Asia is <laughs> like, we're going to publish it. We're not even going to look at it. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, this is a side scroll. No, well, yeah, yeah, it's side scrolling. It is a side scrolling platformer kind of situation uh, where you are a unnamed uh, person with a. Uh, asbestos suit, flamethrower, and a jetpack. 
um, you have been charged with the extermination, the the cleansing, purification, they call it actually, of uh, of these places, these biomes, where there are mutated creatures that, you know, came from some, I don't know, some experiment gone wrong kind of thing. Uh, things like, you know, giant slugs that are actually way fast and kind of look like dinosaurs. Like dinosaurs with no legs, let's call them. And, um... You know, like werewolves and uh, and floating skulls and things like that. Anyways, so you go through the stage and you basically, um, like I said, you know, you use your uh, your weaponry. That's actually a little bit more than a simple flamethrower in in some of the stages. Um, but you pick up your weaponry, your ammo packs, and uh, your double jumps, and you know. You have a certain, you know, you have a little skull counter that represents the amount of enemies there are left in the stage, and uh, you have to kill all those enemies to finish the level. Uh, the kind of, you know, gimmick, uh, the further gimmick, I suppose you could say, to this game is that uh, flamethrower ammunition, as well as jetpack ammunition, is limited. Um, however, I think that, as far as I can tell, with the with the jetpack, it it refills over time. But you actually do have like a hard limit on how much uh, gasoline is available. <laughs> you know, this being 2022, I suppose. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, and you have about five hits before you get killed, and um, there are sometimes health refills. Um, the other kind of interesting thing about the the ammunition uh, about this game is that once your your gasoline runs out you actually have to stop and reload, and it takes a full couple of seconds. Um, you can't just reload in the middle of action like a gosh darn, uh, you know, light gun shooter or something like that. Um, you actually fully stop, reload, and then, you know, you're going back to town. Um, it's an interesting game. Like, the action is pretty good. I mean, enemies just kind of move in predictable patterns. Uh, think, like, kind of modern Castlevanias where, like, they're bigger than you, they're faster than you, but, you know, they're pretty predictable in what they're going to do when you're around. Uh, so that's kind of... And because they take a while to take down with a flamethrower, because these are, you know, mutated, uh, you know, what uh, you know, abominations of, of God's plan, <laughs> um, then, yeah, it can take a little bit. Unless you pick up something like, you know, you get a propane... A blaster or something like that, which shoots green flames, and it shoots it in kind of like a a shotgun style, you know, really powerful but short range. Um, I mean, you know, that's better than the the initial blowtorch, which is you know uh, low power and also short range. Um, so you can pick those up. They are based on which levels you find them in. And uh, again, if you die, then you start the whole level over again. I mean, there's it's in, it's infinite lives, but you have one shot to like do everything in a given stage. And you know they start throwing enemies in the double digits at you. You know, pretty much from the onset. So you know you essentially have one life to take down double digit monsters that can do a lot of damage to you if you're not careful. There's a lot of replaying stages, and then at the end of you know, at, at the fifth stage of each of these biomes, there is a boss, and uh, <laughs> the bosses are pretty tough in that I have not beaten the first one yet. <laughs> so, oh, geez. there you go. Well, it's, yeah, again, it's, it's something that, you know, you can do. The It's one of those kind of things where it's like, the enemies aren't super challenging, except that they are faster than you, almost to the man. Uh, it's just the fact that, like, you're kind of clumsy because of the fact that, you know, you have the limited ammo, short range, and plus you have to stop and refill after so many seconds of, you know, blasting this, uh, not super effective weapon. Um, so yeah. The other interesting thing about it, like, maybe this changes in later levels, but the title screen music and, like, the first biome music is very, like, Coldplay-like. <laughs> it's very... It's very mellow and like uh, melodious, like for what's going on here, which is just a you know burning up of all these like hideous abominations, and you know or dying in a bloody heap or running into green flame pits and exploding and whatnot. <laughs> uh, it, I don't know. It was one of those things where it's like I feel like somebody started with the title and just tweaked a few things in an existing game and was like, okay, it's good to go. Arsonist heaven. <laughs> well, it's five bucks. What do you think about it? Uh, I, that's, that's kind of the sweet spot, honestly. I mean, again, it's a Rattalika game, so there is quality here. Um, I'm gonna say, 
it's a try it for um for most but if you if you're already kind of into Rattalika stuff in there you know they're five dollar uh wonder wonder games then um uh, yeah this one's this one's up there with them i would say that there's nothing to disqualify it from from your um attention apart from the fact that it, it you know it is cheap it looks it looks actually a lot better than than uh than anything else like it's it's good pixel art but like it kind of plays cheap and it is cheap and that's that is what you're getting out of it so gonna give it a try it officially cool uh next is puzzle galaxy developed and published by naptime games released july 22nd on switch is a free-to-play base game with various dlc packs with added puzzles uh play beautiful Puzzles with varied illustrations, breathtaking photos, and special video puzzles playing after completing a particular assembly. Purnell, what's going on in Puzzle Galaxy? I'm sorry, my ears don't work like they used to. I Um, didn't hear any of that. It's because I'm old and I can't speak loudly. Uh, Anyway, let me stop. Let me just cut the joke. And also, it was kind of fitting because of the little puzzle game. (laughs) I digress. So... I'm actually now that I know this is a free game because I didn't know if it was a free to pick up off the store or not. That changes my vibe on this entirely. Um, so the idea behind this game is that it is literally just a puzzle construction game. You boot it up, and there are four categories. I guess four overall categories you can select from. There's beautiful views, space, and steam, cuteness overload, animal album, and beautiful views. So. Of these things, you have a variety of like different topics you can like work with. For example, beautiful views has city panoramas and landscapes, and there are just like a few, I guess, sample puzzles I'll call them that you can play in the game proper when you download it for free. When you choose an image, for example, Cosmos Fun Number One, there are about ten images in here. I see a little bit more than that. And you choose an image, and it gives you the option to choose between how many puzzle pieces you want that image to be broken up into. Between six pieces, which is why, um, and 150 is the seemingly the max that you can get on here. Once you select the puzzle, it will do a little quick display where it displays the controls, and it'll just like kind of do a burst image effect where it'll show all the pieces being broken off of the board, and it's time for you to construct a puzzle. You are able to scroll through a number of the pieces, but not all of them, for example, but mainly if you're doing the big puzzles. If you're doing like the little dinky six-piece puzzles, you can pretty much just touch them all whenever you freaking want. But if you do, like, say, the 150-piece puzzle, they give you a number of them to start with that you want to work around with. And you can try to work with them as best you can. You select it and drag it and put it onto the board. And if you put it in the right place, the game will kind of slot it in for you. If you don't choose the right place, it'll kind of like this thing was like, and it'll shake left to right until you just kind of say, fuck it, I quit. I can't do it. And you'll move on. So if you don't, however, like the pieces you got, you can press the pretty much the, let me see here, like it's pretty much like the R button and it kind of like randomizes the next load of pieces you get. So you can keep doing that until you get a set of puzzle pieces you want to work with. Kind of like real puzzle construction, only digital in that, you know, sometimes you're like, I can't do anything with these pieces. Give me another bag of pieces. And the person passes you a bunch and you work with them that way. Um, as you're basically doing this, you're putting pieces in, sliding them in, and slowly but surely, you got a picture that you can work with. Ta-da! It's done. And that's kind of cool. If you do certain ones that are pretty much sort of like panoramic shots, when you finish the puzzle, a short animation will run of what you constructed. For example, one of them is like a little dog in a meadow. You complete the puzzle, and it show you a cute little animation of a dog running in the meadow in a circle because he's crazy, and he doesn't know where he's trying to go. But whatever, he's a dog, and he's precious. Let him go. Um, so that ends up being the ma- pretty much the gist of the game. If you find yourself wanting to do more actual puzzles, however... I did go to the eShop when it became available and looked at what's available there. And again, like originally I thought you had to pay for the game and then just, you know, buy puzzles afterwards. But now knowing that it's free, you can get all the other puzzles of which there's like, I want to say at least 150 more for $10. So that in itself isn't really all that bad of a deal. Because if you keep doing the 150s, you'll pretty much make, you'll keep you busy for a bit. Um, the few gripes I have about this game, you know, because again, keep in mind it's just a puzzle building game. It's not trying to reinvent the wheel here and be like a, you know, a innovative masterpiece or anything. But I wish that you could do larger puzzles, like a thousand piece puzzles, because that's what I'm used to doing. Though 
also, I guess, admittedly, that has that probably loses some of its zeal when you're not doing it on a table when you got puzzles of that scope. But still, be nice you could do something like five hundred to a thousand piece puzzles. Also, it may affect the how some how puzzle people feel in regards to the ease of the game. But there's no rotate puzzle pieces option, so the pieces that they give you are always in the correct orientation, hmm. which makes, makes things it makes a, it fair a bit lot easier, easier than. Yes, it does. And some people might hear that and go, you know, good, because I don't want to deal with all the orientation crap. But someone <laughs> like me, however, I don't know. I feel like a part of the puzzle construction element is having to orient the pieces and make sure everything's exactly how it's supposed to be. So by taking that away, I do feel like it loses a little something. Um, I guess one last thing, which is less of a gripe and more of a personal thing that's worth pointing out, is if you're the type of person who wants to just not really solve the puzzle and they just want to just drop whatever wherever, this game is up in a, set up in a way where if you just want to you know, brute force the damn puzzles, you can just drop the puzzle piece here, fail, here, fail, here, <laughs> fail. Oh, it worked. After a couple of tries, it will send the puzzle piece back, but then you can just take it out and do it again. So it's not <laughs> like they're going to tell you what you can't do. So it's kind of working on the honor system in that if you if you buy this game, I mean, obviously play games how you want, but you'll be kind of cheating yourself if you buy a puzzle game and they just brute force the puzzles. Yeah. <laughs> they just solve them. So, but I mean, all in all, this game does what it's signed up to do. I mean, it is a, at its core, a light puzzle construction game. That's digital. So you have to have a giant table to play it. You just sit down and kind of get a little therapeutic with it and have fun. Well, it's a free to play base game. So I, I guess it's a no brainer whether or not it's worth downloading that, but is it worth splurging on any of the other puzzle packs at least? I would say value wise, I think the value's there. If you end up downloading this puzzle pack thing and you're like, I like puzzles, I'm having fun with these few demos they give me. Yeah, I would just buy the full set. They're on sale right now anyway, which is why I'm get I'm not even sure if the nine ninety nine is the sale price or the perma price. But at nine ninety nine I think it's a it's an easy recommendation if you're a fan of puzzle construction games. Nice. And uh, if you are interested, they do have the the puzzles available in four separate packs, ranging from like right now on sale two seventy nine to three forty nine. Or they have, I guess, in game they offer a bundle of everything. I'm just looking on the the eShop page; it doesn't have the complete bundle there. But if it's available in game, I guess you know, rock on, go for it, and get the whole thing. It's ready. Yeah, your microphone doesn't pick you up when you do that. <laughs> it's oh, too well, old for his microphone to work. <laughs> <laughs> if you're old like we are, like Aki is, this is definitely an easy recommendation. Pick it up. Cool. All right, one final game to talk about tonight. Pretty Girls Breakout Plus, developed and published by Zoo Corporation, released July 28th on Steam for $4.99. Pretty Girls Breakout Plus, a battling action type breakout game that hits, hits, and hits back, is powered up. New game modes and new gimmicks have been added to make Pretty Girls Breakout Plus. Chris, what makes Pretty Uh, Girls Breakout Plus plus plusier? Well, the girls are plus here, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, for real. Um, the original Pretty Girls Breakout, which I did review, I actually forgot. And then I looked in my Steam library and saw it right above this one. I was like, oh, yeah. And so I played that one, too, because I was like, I need to know what the difference is here. And then I eventually was like, you know what? No. <laughs> but know no, that I will there's say no that- difference or just... No, it's no, not the, worth it, or <laughs> yeah, just no. I'm I'm not going to put that much time into it. Oh, okay. um, no, it it <laughs> it really is. It there are some differences in this one. Um, however, the basic uh core of it is the same. So it is Breakout, which some folks know as Arkanoid. Some people might know as Break 'Em All. Uh, some people might know it as Thunder and Lightning on the NES. And if you are that cool, then then talk to me because I want to <laughs> I want to meet the second person who played that game. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's where you know it's a ball that drops down, and you know you're the paddle, and you you know bounce the ball back up to clear out these blocks that disappear when the ball hits them. Uh, and then try to clear them all. Like, it's, you know, everybody's played, well, most people have played some variation of this. Uh, in this one, the uh, there's a girl with two lightsabers who is the uh, the paddle, and instead of it being a passive, you know, just let the ball hit her and bounce off, um, that doesn't work that way. You actually have to use, uh, you can use a controller or a mouse, 
and uh, one of two buttons will control the left sword or the right sword. And depending on if you hit it with the left thing or the right thing is going to determine uh, what direction it goes in and with what part of the sword, like if it's the uh, the laser tip or just the, uh, or, you know, the the other part, <laughs> whatever it's called, um, will determine like the speed and things like that. So if you get a really good hit, you'll get some good speed and a good trajectory. Um, so it doesn't strictly follow like the physics rules of like other paddle ball games, but that's fine. Uh, this one, it does add some things to the playing fields apart, uh, you know, from the last one. It it has like move enemies that actually move around, um, and I think they can damage you. I'm not actually even sure. I you know, um, but yeah, they they move around and stuff, so they're moving targets. And um, oh, and like I said, you know the the life system is basically like Zelda hearts. You lose a Zelda heart if the ball, like if you lose the ball. So it's not like really punishing in that sense, um, which is pretty cool. And they also have like blocks that kind of like count down as you hit them. They also have like armored blocks, things like that. But they had some stuff like that in the previous game too. Um, the so the main well, that's the the gameplay draw is is such. You know, it's it's a solid game. They always are. Um, it's fun to play. Then, you know, the other half of it is that there are, like, waifu anime girls to unlock costumes for. Now, in this one, like, in the last game, it was a little bit more of a variety. Um, you know, it was, like, young, you know, disturbingly youngish-looking girls, and then, like, you know, furries, and, like, you know, the busty goth GFs, things like that. Um, not, not goth, but you know what I mean. Well, in this one, they, like, again, this is plus, so every single girl follows the same body type, and you can guess what that is. Um, the only Eagle real difference between... titties. Yeah, there you go. You said it. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so the, the only other real difference between them is the hair and the name. Um, and in fact, two of them have very similar shades of bluish black hair. Uh... The thing about it, like, so in the last game and in most of these games, you unlock different costumes through playing through a girl's stages. And as you beat the stages, then you get to unlock the different costumes, um, which tend to get skimpier as you go. But in fact, the the Pretty Girl series is kind of almost entirely moved away from that. Now it's it's really just dress up. You're just changing their costume into something uh, equally, if not more modest than what they were wearing <laughs> to begin with. So this is absolutely not a uh, a fan servicey type game, even though the girls absolutely look like they're up for it. Um, so the way that you actually unlock costumes in this is not strictly through playing a specific stage. You collect points at the end of the stage and then spend the points in the dressing room. Uh, so you do like a point exchange, 750 unlocks a costume. There are two. There are some unlockable characters that I'm not sure how to unlock because um, I haven't played fully through the game. But there's there's even more girls than just the um, than just the seven that you see at the beginning of the game. So that's kind of cool. Looks yeah, like there's a lot there's more content in the to game, this one. I believe. Yeah that that sounds about right. Um, so yeah, there's that. Uh, there are. There's a universal uh, ball speed setting, which <laughs> sounds dirty. Uh, you can like basically half the speed of the game, or you can uh, increase the speed by 50%, which is kind of cool. I actually like to play a nice fast game. Um, the only complaint I have about this, I don't like using the mouse in this game. Um, when you move, like you know, the 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 paddle movement uh, tracks to the mouse movement, but it has it has momentum for some reason. So when you like move in, it's not like it tracks it one to one. It's like if you move the mouse faster then the character moves faster, but if you stop, then the character slows down and then stops. And uh, that can be harrowing if you're actually trying to play it. Fortunately, it works perfectly with a controller. So I, I would recommend you use the controller with this one. Cool. And uh, yeah, like I said, the only, the naughtiest thing you can unlock in this is a, a fairly modest swimsuit. So uh, don't be expecting this to be like an after dark kind of game. Uh, although <laughs> if your mom catches you playing it, she might have some questions. All right. Well, the game is five bucks. What are your thoughts? Well, uh, I hate to be a broken record about this, but, uh, I always say this about pretty girls games. 
if you are into playing a pretty solid uh, game that you can play a million different other kind of ways, but this time with, you know, girls with nice boobs, then go for it. It's a it's a buy it. There's nothing wrong with it. Awesome. Yeah. Arnell, did you have something to say? What? I thought you were going to ask something. Oh, no, no. It's, it's right. pretty girls. All right. Pretty girls. He has no questions. All right. That is it for this episode. Made it through another one. Uh, music. I'm just going to play more Metroid Metal because I saw them at BitGen and it was friggin' awesome. So Heck they yeah. were really good. Really good. Oh, my God. It was so good. Pernell, what did you think of BitGen? I think it's a buy it. A hundred percent buy it. I'd do it again. It was worth going down there. I feel like it's that we're in that block now where it's like, you know, you know, COVID's not going anywhere. So you're like, do I go? Is it was it worth the chance of going there and know I could get sick? And the end result from this was absolutely was worth it. Like it's I had a great time. I don't regret going in the least. I got to see a lot of friends, hear some fantastic freaking music. It was just nice, you know. And yeah, we haven't it was, had a it was good get now. It was it was three years since Bit Gen, I think. Yeah, wow. I think three years since the last one. But uh, yeah, it was yeah. awesome seeing you. It was awesome seeing guys like Stemage and Viking Guitar and uh, Mega Beardo couldn't make it because he did get the the Rona. A couple of guys Ooh. actually. Some of the some of the people in the bands yeah. ended up getting sick. Uh, but uh, Dan, right from Metroid Metal, so they had Chris um from arm cannon step in on bi- uh bass keys yeah chunk style couldn't make it uh but uh, danimal from arm cannon was there so he was he was included and kubosh from arm cannon and it was just fucking awesome to watch it was an awesome show from small, start like, to finish and i needed it never I got to say, as a small weird aside that I was actually happy about, it was kind of nice to be there and realize that people actually recognize who recognize me as a person. Now I'm not just like, <laughs> hey, I saw your thing. Oh, thanks. Man. It's like, oh, Pernell, what are you doing here? Like, wait, you know my name? Yeah, I know your name. I'm like, oh, my God. People know who the fuck I am now. This is really cool. Like, it was it, it felt great. And it was nice to you know, chat with people, see them in their element, too. And trying to play Mega Man X while great concerts were going on. So I wanted to be that guy like I did at the DJ Cutman <laughs> show years ago, beating games while live music was playing. But in this instance, I just couldn't do it. I wanted to focus on the music. So I stopped. We, but, uh, we beat Area 51. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, nice. shit. Yeah, buddy. We, just, even, we even got like one or two of the bonus rounds from shooting the barrels and shit. There's something fun about playing those games in the element of other people who also appreciate that stuff. Mm-hmm. Like you can totally play those games at home, but it's not the same. It's not the same. Well, Area 51, you can't really play at home. <laughs> I well, mean, true, but think you can play a half assed like, version, but. Well, not even just that. I mean, say, like, for example, you just happen to like, go, like, there's like a lump number of like retro malls that are popping up, like arcades lately. Like, there's one in Allentown that just opened up. And if you went there to play, it wouldn't have the same charm as playing it there, as playing it at Bitchin, playing it at Bitchin. Or in the case of a console game, like Mega Man X, which I was mentioned before, yeah, I have, I have all the Mega Man X games. I can play whenever the hell I want. But there's something special about playing it in a space where other people around you would appreciate the fact that you're, also, you're playing a game that they also like. It's, it's hard to explain. It's just, you know, it's copacetic. It feels good. Uh... So I always get, I get, I get a kick out. So I feel like you playing area 51, it probably had an extra special bit of zing to it playing it there versus at some random Chuck E. Cheese or a mall or something. <laughs> uh, I'm looking on eBay. I could get an area 51 arcade machine by Atari for, uh, 3,250 bucks. <laughs> you get it home, set it up and go, wow, I own area 51. Press start once and go, yes, I'm done. <laughs> you should have went with police simulator. <laughs> oh, Go geez. buy this. I can get the Simpsons arcade game. Holy shit! Uh, I'm done. Oh, the police, the police sim arcade game was so much fun. I used to play that at bowling practice all the time. And I was, like, why are we still doing this? It's the end of the show. Does anyone have any final words? <laughs> so I want to talk about the Simpsons arcade game for 20 minutes. Okay, fuck. I'm out of dialogue. Anyway, the point is, arcade games are great. Bit Jim was great. I hope they do it next year because I would like to go. Keep the monkey pox the fuck away from it. <laughs> yeah, just what we need a disease with an even stupider name. 